they started digging, and based on what they found, it turned into a, as of uh, 2007, a 212-year-old mystery that continues on to this day. Since that time, many groups of adventurers ended up on Oak Island uh, trying to solve the mystery. This is Tim Benall of BenallofAmerica.com with another edition of BOA Audio Season 3. This week we have a very cool interview for you on the program. As some of you may know, over the course of the summer, I took a trip up to Halifax, Nova Scotia to visit former BOA Audio guest Paul Kimball. During my visit, Paul and his friends and I went on a little esoteric road trip to Mahone Bay, Canada to check out the infamous esoteric landmark Oak Island and the Oak Island Money Pit. So enamored was I with the Oak Island Money Pit mystery that when I returned to America to start putting together BOA Audio Season 3, I knew I wanted to have an interview with an expert on Oak Island to discuss this fascinating story. So I got in touch with Danny Hennigar of the Oak Island Tourism Society to come on the program and discuss the Oak Island Money Pit mystery. In this interview, we're going to be discussing how it all started, how it has evolved over the years, the popular theories as to what is at the bottom of the money pit, the famous Oak Island side stories like the death of Robert Restall, Nolan's Cross, and Borehole 10X. Plus, we're going to find out the latest news on what's going on at Oak Island today, and of course, tons and tons more. This is a richly detailed edition of BOA Audio, covering the Oak Island money pit mystery from top to bottom and providing a wealth of information for those of you who, like me, had only really somewhat heard of the Oak Island story, but had really not delved into it in depth. That's what we do here this week with Danny Hennigar. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Danny Hennigar, let me give you a little bit of background on him. Amateur historian Danny Hennigar is a lifelong student of the 212-year-old Oak Island mystery, and has spent considerable time researching the documented history theories, excavations, personalities, and tragedies that have made Oak Island so famous. Danny has written many articles about Oak Island for magazines and newspapers, and has appeared on TV, film, and radio broadcasts in both Canada and the U.S. He is currently an executive member of the Oak Island Tourism Society, and the co-author of the book The Oak Island Code. He was a tour guide on Oak Island in the past, when public tours were conducted seven days a week, and continues to serve in this capacity during the annual Explore Oak Island Days Festival, the one weekend per year when the island is open to the public. His website is www.oakislandsociety.ca. Check it out. Without any further ado, let's rock and roll. This interview was recorded on September 25th, 2007. Danny Hennigar talking about the Oak Island Money Pit Mystery on Banal of America Audio Season 3. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Been All of America Audio. We have a very special episode here this week. We're really going outside of our normal realm of uh, topics, but we're going to be covering something that I investigated personally this summer and really found to be a fascinating esoteric mystery, and that is the Oak Island mystery. It's been around since 1795. It's one of the longest-running mysteries in esoterica as far as the modern era goes. It's just an amazing place and has an amazing story to it, and I wanted to have someone who I had met up at the Explore Oak Island Days Festival. He ran the whole thing pretty much with his group, the Oak Island Tourism Society. We really hit it off, and I wanted to bring him on the show here to to really talk about the Oak Island mystery, because it's one of the more popular stories in Esoterica. It really doesn't get as much media play as you expect. Please welcome our guest, Danny Hennigar, the Communications Director for the Oak Island Tourism Society and also the co-author of the Oak Island Code. The website for Oak Island Tourism Society is oakislandsociety.ca. Danny Hennigar, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Tim, and I'd like to say hello to all your viewers, and I hope that the next uh, little while we give them a wet their appetite about the mystery of Oak Island. Definitely, definitely. 
Uh, well, let's start off with your bio and your background, uh, where you came from, how you found an interest in the Oak Island mystery, and uh, how you sort of gravitated towards that. Well, Tim, I've lived in this area uh, near Oak Island all my life, so it's difficult not to live in the area and be aware of Oak Island. So I guess my first visit to Oak Island was back in the 1960s when I was a very young lad. I'm 52 years old now, so it gives you an idea of my vintage. And uh, my dad took me out there in a speedboat, and we walked around the island. So that was my first impression. But I really got bitten by the Oak Island bug back in 1973 when, as a high school student, I got a job uh, with the uh, Department of Tourism here in Nova Scotia as a tour guide in Oak Island. And uh, the more I read about it, the more people I met from around the world and the media that came along, I thought to myself, wow, this is, uh, this is a heck of a story. And I just kept studying it and uh, reading up on it it and talking to people who searched for the treasure and uh, lots of kooks and uh, all that sort of thing. And it really fired me up. And um, I I have a great appreciation for any mystery. But this one especially because it's in my backyard and it's probably, uh, well, it is recognized around the world. People know about it. Oh, definitely, definitely. It's, uh, It's really popular. I was surprised as I first started doing the investigation. I guess let's start out and bring the newcomers up to date on, on uh, what exactly the Oak Island mystery is. Talk a little bit about uh, the discovery of the money pit and sort of how that whole thing came together in 1795 on Oak Island. Well, as you said, it all began back in 1795 with what we refer to as the accidental discovery of the money pit. And the money pit turned out to be a pretty benign looking thing at the beginning of 1795. A chap by the name of Donald Daniel McGinnis who owned land on Oak Island in 1795, was out there presumably, I don't know, looking over his property, see where he's going to put his farm, that sort of thing. But anyway, he ended up into a, an area where there's a clearing and uh, there's moss-covered stumps visible. And most startlingly, in the middle of this clearing was a large old oak tree with a limb that extended out over um, the ground, as most limbs do. <laughs> And uh, supposedly, as the story goes, there was a tackle block hanging from the limb that was suspended over a 13-foot in diameter depression in the ground at the base of the tree. Now, a lot of people think that's uh, embellishment. Maybe it was. But anyway, that's a story we, we have to deal with. But anyhow, that's how the treasure hunt started. Now... Donald Daniel McGinnis is 34 years old at the time of the discoveries, and uh, he got two friends of his, John Smith and Anthony Vaughn, to help him out with the treasure, the digging for what they believed to be pirate treasure at that time. They started digging, and based on what they found, it uh, turned into, a, as of uh, 2007, a 212-year-old uh, mystery that continues on to this day. Since that time, many groups of adventurers ended up on Oak Island uh, trying to solve the mystery, and they ran across a lot of amazing clues and things that spurned them on, and um, we even had the six people who have died in Oak Island over the years searching for this treasure, so it's become a very, very serious proposition. A lot of money has been spent, a lot of people have gone broke. Um, to my knowledge, to this day, nobody has been um, accused of... Uh, of uh, uh, creating any type of a business um, uh, folly or, or trying to cheat people over the money, that sort of thing. There has been stockholders or shareholders over the years, but uh, it's it's gone on to this very day. And in fact, as we speak in this interview right now, there's uh, five men who are going to prosecute this treasure hunt again in uh, 2007 and into 2008, possibly 2009, to see if they can solve this mystery. So it has a heck of a history. There's been at least 18 books written about the um, the history of Oak Island, and every one of them gives you slightly different bits of information or slightly different slant. And I would encourage your readers to at least find one of these books and read, read it up and uh, just see what they think of the mystery. I guess let's sort of dive in with what the, the prevalent theories are about what's at the bottom of Oak Island and, and sort of how those theories came about. Well, it, it runs everywhere from the ridiculous <laughs> to the sublime. And uh, we have one gentleman in Ireland who is in contact with uh, one of the better-known authors about Oak Island, Darcy O'Connor. This gentleman from Ireland really, truly, in his own heart, believes that uh, leprechauns built some sort of a colony underneath the Oak Island. Oh, wow. Now, of course, that's absolutely ridiculous. But uh, anyway, that gives you an idea of the types of theories that are out there. Mm-hmm. Now, some of the more serious theories. Uh, there's a gentleman in Prince Edward Island, a province in the Nova Scotia, 
who is an engineer and has been following the story of Oak Island for quite a few years. His name is Graham Harris. And Mr. Harris has developed a very, very interesting theory with regard to Oak Island. And I'll paraphrase it very quickly. He believes that um, Sir William Phipps, who initially came from the state of Maine, and uh, Phipps, uh, Phipps, we know, found a treasure of a vessel called La Concepcion off of uh, Hispaniola, which at that time, right now, that island is known better as Haiti in the Dominican Republic. And he was supposed to recover treasure off of that shipwreck, and we know he did. That's a historical fact. But the uh, but the Harris believes that he secreted that treasure out to Oak Island to bury it because at that time of um, that recovery, Oak Island in uh, Nova Scotia would have been a very um, unpopulated spot as far as the Europeans go. There is native settlement here, but they are very few. And uh, Mr. Harris continues um, with his uh, theory that um, he believes that uh, Phipps buried the treasure to finance uh, an overthrow of an English king, and uh, it never happened, and the treasure is never brought back up. And he feels that in the mid-1700s, the British government tried to make a recovery of the treasure, and uh, were not able to, and built uh, safeguard systems to try and keep the treasure safe from recovery, and... Uh, that's pretty much the basis of his theory. Now, there's a heck of a lot more to it, and there's a lot uh, more about Mr. Harris's theory on the, the Oak Island Tourism Society's website. Mm -hmm. One of the other more popular theories out there, of course, is the Templar Knights or the, the Masons the Masonic Lodge. There's people who believe that there's a, a big old um, conspiracy going on between the Masons and the, the Knights Templar. And I've even had Knights Templar to my home before asking me questions about Oak Island. But, oh, wow. They, uh, they believe that um, that the Masons uh, deposit such things, or the Templar Knights deposit such things as the Holy Grail, perhaps the Ark of the Covenant, uh, vast uh, religious treasures, perhaps even religious secrets. Uh, I'm sure most of your listeners have heard about the talk about the, the Holy Grail being uh, perhaps uh, information more so than an actual physical chalice or a cup of some kind. People theorize that that information may also lead to um, the belief that uh, Christ was just an ordinary man with a wife and children, like uh, you know, a lot of ordinary guys are. And <laughs> they believe that that secret is hidden under Oak Island. All that information is never meant to be recovered. And there is some evidence out there that um, can spurn these thoughts a little bit and egg, egg them on a little bit, and uh, that's become part of the. Um, the uh, theories of Oak Island. And of course, there's pirates. Uh, people believe that pirates buried the treasure underneath the Oak Island. And there's a chap in Southampton, England, who is absolutely unswayingly convinced that Captain William Kidd, who died in 1701, and a buddy of his, John Avery, and the Pirate King, conspired to buy, bury a treasure under Oak Island in a communal bank, with many privateers and pirates being involved, and their treasures buried in a complicated warren of uh, tunnels and shafts under the island and uh, of course the, the evidence does not support it very well but nonetheless uh, he's absolutely convinced of this so there's there's a few of the many theories with yeah. regard to Oak Island. Now is there anything that makes Oak Island stand out from the other islands in Mahone Bay because I know when we were taking the tour you had pointed out Dog Island that was like right across from Oak Island I mean is it just sort of a luck of the draw thing and, and if it hit, and if something had gone down differently you know we'd be having this interview about the Dog Island mystery or is it or is <laughs> well it, the Frog it, Island is what you're thinking of Frog Island Oh Frog Island uh, yeah, oh, I'm Frog sorry <laughs> yeah, well it's easy easy to uh, to uh, get that mistaken there's there's over 300 islands in the bay called Mahone Bay. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, the name Mahone of Mahone Bay, it's an ancient French word, comes from Mediterranean area, and it actually means a low-lying pirate craft or pirate vessel. So huh. I'm not even sure how Mahone Bay uh, got its name, but that's that's what the word Mahone means. And piracy certainly was not um, unknown to this area. But what, makes Oak, what made Oak Island stand up from the rest of the islands in the bay Prior to the 1960s, there was a very unusual grove of oak trees on Oak Island. Um, most of the oak trees we have in Canada and Nova Scotia, they're, they're very stout, very thick trees that grow, um, that grow up uh, very, and before very long you have a large limb going out and another big limb and, uh, you know, just your typical looking oak tree. But the oak trees that existed on this island, 
prior to the 1960s were high, very tall, spindly trees with a canopy on the top and looked rather like an umbrella. And in the old photographs of Oak Island, you can see what these trees look like, and they're absolutely startling looking, and that's how it received its name. Initially, initially Oak Island was called Oak Island, or was called Island Number 28. And then later on, it's known as Gloucester Island, and then uh, people decided, well, let's call it Oak Island because of these unusual groves. Now, your question about, um, you know, why, why Oak Island as opposed to Frog or Apple or Birch or any of the other islands in the bay that would make every bit as good a deposit uh, site, my personal opinion is that Oak Island was chosen because it's far into the bottom of the bay. Mm-hmm. There is uh, at least two escape routes, and I think just strategically looking at it from a strategic military style of view point, that Oak Island affords a, a lot of um, a lot of things that other islands don't. It being you know way back at the end of the bay, deep water going right up to the island, two escape routes. There is plenty of opportunity on some of the smaller islands, a little further out, to put any type of uh, gun emplacements or manpower that could. Um, go after ships that may possibly be coming in to see what was going on. So I think I think from a strategic viewpoint, Oak Island was a great choice, very close to the mainland. And whoever was here obviously had to have um, a supply of food. And the area around Oak Island, the mainland at that time, would have been rich with moose, caribou, uh, rabbits, a lot of berries, wild apples, a lot of things like that. So... I think strategically, Oak Island was a, was a good choice. And now you pointed out that the original guy who found the uh, the money pit, he owned the island. He owned a portion of the island, yeah. just a land lot. Okay. It seems like over the course of time, then, uh, as the people would give up on searching for the island, then, then the ownership would change hands. How did it change to where it is today, where like a pretty big group of people sort of own the island almost exclusively? Well, when, when Oak Island was first uh, divvied up by the British government, uh, and given away as land lots, it, uh, it was part of a huge, huge grant of land called the Shoreham Grant. It was over 100,000 acres of land. And what the British government did, uh, they, they brought settlers in to try and counteract the, the French government's attempt to settle this part of Nova Scotia. And the French were here first, and uh, the British and the French, of course, have never been the best of buddies uh, when it comes to... Um, new lands and that sort of business. So uh, the British brought their settlers in, German and um, Swiss settlers, that sort of thing, Protestants, and uh, that they're going to give you land here. So the land was initially given out to people. And on Oak Island specifically, it was broken up into 32 lots of about four acres each. So it was either uh, granted to people or given to people um, back at that uh, time, back in the... um, say, about all the mid-1700s. And mm-hmm. then from that point onwards, people sold the land, bought the land, uh, and that's how it ended up uh, in various times over the years. Uh, the island has been owned by one person, then was owned by multiple people, one person again, back to multiple people. And as of today, it's owned by about seven different entities or groups of people. It sounds like there was some a fair amount of like rivalries going on on the treasure hunt. Yeah, there have been over the years. And, and I, I think it pretty much started way back in the 1800s. There was a, a chap who um, supposedly found something uh, on the end of the drill bit when it was brought up out of the ground. He was seen removing something from the end of the drill bit. He was seen washing it and then placing it in his pocket. And his name was Pit Blado. That was his surname. And uh, when they approached Pit Blado and said, you know, what you put in your pocket? And he said, well, look, uh, at the next shareholders meeting, I'll show you what it was. And uh, that was the end of it. Um, he sort of split off from the group, and along with the Colonel Archibald, he tried to buy that portion of Oak Island uh, unsuccessfully, and he just sort of disappeared from history. And we have no idea what the man put in his pocket, or even indeed if he did. I mean, you know, these stories are old, and it's difficult to say if they're true or not. And those types of rivalries have continued even up into present day. And uh, probably the most famous rivalry on Oak Island was between Dan Blankenship and Fred Nolan. We're actually Triton Alliance Limited and Fred Nolan, Dan Blankenship being the, the man on the ground who uh, sort of led the, the fight into it. But basically what happened was the land the land was all sold, the whole island was sold to a fellow by the name of uh, M.R. Chapel from Sydney, Nova Scotia. 
And Amar thought he owned the entire island, but there's a guy by the name of Fred Nolan who uh, challenged it and said, look, I think that some of the lots in Stanley Island weren't uh, properly transferred in the, the bill of sale. And he challenged it in court, and by God, he won. And he ended up with seven lots in the middle of the island, much to the chagrin and annoyance of uh, Triton Alliance Limited and M.R. Chapel, who was um, a major partner into it. And to this day, that portion of land is still uh, in, in, well, it's not in no one's hands anymore. He's sort of sold some of his lots and given some of his lots to his son. But uh, nonetheless, that, that rift occurred back in the 70s and 80s. And I'll tell you, it was hot at times. These these guys uh, each believed that they were right. And when they ended up in court, uh, no one ended up with his piece of land. And uh, Triton lost about seven, seven lots. Oh, wow. Yeah. Just to sort of take a little dive back into time, as like we were saying, the uh, the original discovery of the money pit was 1795. Then then it, it sort of remained uh, a localized legend, I guess you could say, or it didn't have any publicity until about 60 years later. I guess just talk a little bit about sort of the evolution of the story, not so much what actually was going on there, but just how it started out sort of local and then became like an international phenomenon. Well, yeah, it's like like we all know, it started in 1795, these three young men digging in the area. and. When they finished their dig, they had, they had gone to as deep as 30 feet, encountering uh, oak log platforms every 10-foot level, firmly embedded in the sides of the shaft in such a way as to make a platform they could stand on. And they knew they were onto something. And believe it or not, they tried to get help from local people, their friends, their neighbors, and whatever have you, and nobody would have a thing to do with it. I can understand that. Back in 1795, uh, People were preoccupied with things, silly things like trying to gather firewood for the winter or yeah. you know, fishing and farming. They didn't have time to fool around on a, in a pit on Oak Island that was 30 feet deep with no treasure being found. Nobody believed at that time anybody go any deeper. So, and of course, Oak Island, even back at that time, had a reputation of being haunted. And um, people were very superstitious. They came from Europe, and a lot of the superstitions came with them. And uh, they were scared of Oak Island, even back at that time. There's a million ghost stories about it. But um, it, uh, the treasure hunt morphed from there to uh, 1804 was the next group that came. And they were from a little further away in a place called Toro. And it's about, um, oh, it's about an hour and a half drive from Oak Island, two hours from Oak Island. And from there, uh, the next group was from around the capital city of Halifax and Truro. Some of the guys in the Truro group ended up with the Halifax group. And then after the Halifax group um, was uh, finished with Oak Island, uh, it was sort of localized. But after that, from about the year early 1900s onwards, we have a lot of Americans becoming very, very interested in Oak Island. Uh, news, as you indicated earlier, news reports are getting out uh, Little pamphlets are being written, newspaper stories were sensationalizing the story and embellishing the story, I may add. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of our friends from down south uh, the border from the States came up and uh, started into the treasure hunt. And we've been having a lot of Americans come up here ever since looking for this treasure and uh, trying to solve the mystery of Oak Island. In fact, uh, right now on Oak Island, uh, there's... Um, with this new treasure hunt group that's uh, going to start up pretty soon. We have Dan Blankship, who is initially from Florida. He's a Canadian citizen now, actually holds dual citizenship. And we have four guys from Michigan who uh, are partnering with Mr. Blankship to uh, look for this, the answer to the mystery. So over the years, it's attracted them a lot of attention initially from local people. And, of course, local people have been involved uh, ever since the beginning pretty well. But uh, the major thrust in the past, um, oh, say, 100 years or so has been with uh, a lot of American people. Interesting. And then I'm sure every every different attempt has its own sort of story, I guess. But uh, talk about first the water tunnel that seemed to be the major stumbling block for excavating the money pit. And then just generally what what were sort of the things that, that has kept this money pit still inaccessible all these years. Well, what, what, what kept getting in the way of all these different parties? Because you'd think after 200 years, someone would have figured it out. But obviously, each time something sort of comes along that, that hurts them, is it just the water tunnel or money woes, engineering difficulties, that kind of thing? What, what are the main uh, stumbling blocks to, to getting to the bottom of the money pit? Well, all three things that you mentioned, lack of money, engineering problems, uh, conditions to overcome have always been uh, the bane of the existence of uh, uh, a successful conclusion to the mystery of Oak Island. But basically what 
has uh, stymied treasure hunters uh, from the beginning up until uh, pretty much present day, although it's difficult to say how the water problem is going to affect the new the new uh, search effort. But, uh, yeah, there, water has been a problem in and around the Money Pit area. And back in 1804, when they excavated down to almost 100 feet, they found the bottom of the shaft was very soppy, very mucky, uh, which is not not surprising. If you dig a hole anywhere around here, you're going to find water. That's not uh, the issue. But when they came back on Monday morning to resume work, they discovered that they had 60 feet of water standing in the shaft. Oh, wow. Later expeditions discovered that um, the water was, in fact, salt water, and it rose and fell with the tide, which is not, not normal. And here in this part of Nova Scotia, not normal at all. Uh, excavations um, in later years, in the 1800s, uh, uh, showed that there was a drain system buried under the beach in Smith Cove, 520 feet away from the money pit, and it was uh, it was a system made of uh, carefully chiseled and placed stones that uh, uh, had a system of uh, five drains that led into a central tunnel, and this tunnel led uh, to the money pit, 520 feet away. In a sub- oh yes, and uh, these drains were covered with uh, sand, eelgrass, stones, gravel, all that sort of thing, but so much coconut fiber that they were able to pile it on the beach in Haycocks. Now, we haven't had coconut trees in Nova Scotia ever <laughs> that I'm aware of. But then again, uh, you know, um, later on in years, uh, digging around the Money Pit area in, in a shaft that was sunk, uh, uh, many shafts that were sunk around the Money Pit, they actually discovered the other end of this flood tunnel. And it was, it was, it was described as being four feet high, two and a half feet wide, and angled at about 22 and a half degrees up. Um, the tunnel has been uh, hit uh, in the middle of it. Um, at different times, has been drilled into at different times, but they never did explore it from one end to the un- to the other, mainly because the tunnel is stuffed with beach stones. So picture a four foot high tunnel, two and a half feet wide, stuffed with beach stones. And how smart is that to use that type of engineering? But anyway, over the years, um, other treasure hunters tried to dig underneath the flood tunnel and dig down below where they thought the treasure was buried and tunnel up to it. But, of course, it, it doesn't take much of an engineer these days to realize that with that type of weight of water, if you try and tunnel up underneath of a, a shaft that's filled with 60 feet of water, you're going to have a problem when yeah. you start getting close to it. It's going to collapse. It's going to collapse hard. But these um, flooding tunnels, there's, there's thought to be at least two. And there's thought to also be um, a natural water inlets that allow water to come in naturally into the Money Pit area. But these are known to be only fissures um, in the bedrock. And it gets a little complicated from here. Earlier in the treasure hunt, there wasn't a lot of heavy pumping done. But from about the 19, I'll say about the 1930s, 1940s onwards, they started to develop better and better pumping technology and uh the problem is with the bedrock that's under that part of Oak Island, when you pump a lot of water through it, mm-hmm. you open up the, the natural fissures that are in the bedrock, which is at about 160 feet, and uh, you get more saltwater inclusion because now you're starting to open up the fissures to the point where uh, the water will find its way down through the sea bottom, down through the, the, uh, the glacial till that covers the uh, the bottom and into the bedrock and into the pumps and over the other side. And the bedrock that's underneath the Volk Island on that end of it is called anhydrite, which is sort of a mixture of limestone and gypsum. And uh, it's water soluble and especially in salt water. So when you start sucking salt water through it, it uh, makes these fissures bigger. So now the complication is not only is that flood tunnel there, possibly two flood tunnels, but now they have natural inclusion of salt water coming in from the ocean that may not have been there prior to, say, the 1930s. So the pumping just sort of made it worse. Yeah, pumping uh, actually is making it worse. And that discovery really started to come to light in the 1980s when during the winter time there they were following through with a, a really heavy pumping regime, and they noticed that the ice that had frozen uh, over the, in the bay is a particularly cold winter, and um, that part of Oak Island actually froze over in the ocean. And uh, they noticed that the two great big holes had opened up in the ice, and they believed that what was happening, they came to the realization that um, because of the pumping that they were doing, that they opened up natural water fissures. 
or water inlets that allowed water to go down through the sea floor and deep through the, the, the covering layer of soil into the bedrock and then up into the pumps. Oh, wow. Yeah. And now you kind of alluded to this story already, but it's one of the more famous stories of Oak Island, and that's Robert Restall and mm. uh, his journey to Oak Island with his family and, of course, the tragic deaths that, that really ended his search for the for the treasure of the money pit. Uh, talk a little bit about Robert Restall and his story. Well, that's a really, really interesting story, and it's well covered in a book written by his daughter, uh, Lee Restall Lamb. It's called The Oak Island Obsession. It gives a little bit of the history of Oak Island, but it really delves in deeply into the history of uh, Restall's uh, expedition to Oak Island, which began in about 1959. Uh, Restall, very interestingly, was a, a circus um a circus performer, and he operated a thing called the Globe of Death. And it was a great big steel cage, and uh, in this cage you bring uh, two motorcycles, and one motorcycle driver would drive horizontally around this cage at uh, you know 30 or 40 miles an hour, while the other motorcycle rider would go perpendicular around the cage. And he and his wife, uh, Mildred, did, did this for a few years throughout to Europe until the war started. And then they ended up in Hamilton, Ontario, in Canada, and uh, he got bitten by the Oak Island bug and ended up on Oak Island in 1959 until his untimely death in 65. His uh, his approach to the treasure hunt was uh, not so much mechanical. He he did a lot of hand excavation. He did a lot of work on the Smith's Cove trying to find the uh, the flood tunnels and did a lot of exploration there and ended up in some very deep shafts that had been sunk by previous treasure hunters and um, exploring some tunnel systems that earlier treasure hunters had left behind and was scratching around on the ground there by hand with his with his son and some hired labor here and there. And on August the 17th, 1965, he had a, a very shallow shaft about 27 feet deep down on the beach of Smith's Cove. He had a little gas pump in operation that day to try and keep the water out of it and Around about three o'clock the afternoon before he and his wife left the island for the mainland in their little boat, he went down to check on the pump, make sure everything is working right. He was steering down into the hole, and geez, he, he tumbled in. And his son, Bobby, saw him fall in, so Bobby went in after his father. And uh, there were some laborers around there burning some brush and whatever have you, and they saw Bobby go in, and, and they thought, geez, Bobby's not coming out. So they went down to see what was going on. And, Another guy went in, and another guy went in, and another guy went in, and at one time there's seven guys down the bottom of this hole, collapsed, drowning in the in the water that was at the bottom of the pit. And by the time it was all over with, three people had been rescued out of the shaft. Two of them had to be resuscitated artificially, and uh, four guys from the Restall expedition died. They were uh, Robert Restall, his son Bobby, who was only I think he was 19 at the time. I may be wrong about that. And uh, Carl Grayser, one of uh, Robert Restall's investors, and a young fellow by the name of Cyril Hiltz, who's only 16 years old, who's working as a laborer on the island. They drowned after being um, overcome by probably carbon monoxide fumes from a gasoline pump at the bottom of the pit. And that, of course, ended their expedition. Then uh, along came other treasure hunters after that. And that actually made six of the number of deaths that had occurred in Oak Island over the years. That's uh yeah, that's an amazing story. I'm definitely gonna have to check out the uh, the rest all book. Yeah, really, it's it is a heck of a story, and it it's, it it just rips at your heart when you you read about it because they they seem to be getting along so well until the last the last year, pretty well, the treasure hunt, little bits of of um, animosity started creeping in, and uh, prior to that, it was like a, it was like a fantasy. For everybody who's living on the island, they live in very crude conditions. They live in a very small shack, and actually two shacks after a while. They had no electricity, no running water. Well, they had running water. You ran and got it. <laughs> it was the only running water they had. Um, uh, Lee Restall Lamb showed me a photograph of uh, what her mom used for a washing machine that was uh, run by a gasoline motor. Oh, wow. You can imagine the washing your clothes outdoors at a washing machine and uh, trying to dry clothes and prepare meals and everything else about the modern conveniences we all take for granted. It's, it's a heck of a story. It's really yeah. well worth reading. If, you, if you're not particularly interested in the mystery of Oak Island, it's, it's a great human interest story. And then uh, we had talked about previously uh, this local legend that I had sort of heard uh, when I was up there over the summer, and that was that seven people must die and all the oak trees must be gone from Oak Island before the mystery is solved. That's right. That's pretty much how it goes. 
Is that something that came up after uh, this Rustall incident, or is that something that's been going on for a while, that, that legend, and, and do you even know where it came from or anything like that? I don't know where it came from, but I do know it's been around a long time. Uh, I have never been able to source out who, who started that particular legend. And I, I asked uh, Dan Blankship about it one time. Dan has been on the island for almost 40 years trying to solve this mystery. I said, Dan, what do you think of that, that legend? He said, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> what he said to me, so I'll leave you with that. All right. <laughs> you sort of alluded to uh, this earlier also, and, and I guess it, it runs counter, I guess, to to what people probably think about what's going on at Oak Island, and that's the, that it's just the money pit. There's been a lot of other digging going on at Oak Island. For starters, talk a little bit about some of the other digging that's gone on there and, and why exactly people will be digging outside of the money pit. Well, there's been... Probably one of the more famous holes uh, that had been sunk on Oak Island is called Borehole 10X. And uh, 10X was um, the result of some investigation. It was a hole sunk as a result of some investigation carried on by Dan Blankship and his partners. And actually, he found the site of the hole by dowsing. And uh, they, they drilled the hole down by 235 feet. And my goodness, they broke into a little cavity about uh, six or seven feet high and while drilling this hole, they brought up bits of metal, and uh, it was a virgin area, meaning that uh, nobody had ever sunk a shaft in around that area before, so they knew that the uh, materials that they were bringing up had to have come from deep underground. They weren't left over from earlier treasure hunting activities. And Like I said, they brought up bits of chains, some hand-drawn wire, uh, some bits of metal that, when um, uh, exposed to the air, oxidized and turned brittle immediately. Some of the stuff has been um, evaluated by uh, experts as to uh, the origins of the metal, and the chain in particular came back as being made prior to 1750, and if you recall, the treasure hunt started in 1795. Now, they wouldn't say exactly how old the chain was, like, you know, is it 1600s era, is it 1701, is it 1720? They just said prior, made prior to 1750, and of course, people who no metals, a Stelco Canada is who did the particular um, examination of that metal. They said the note was made prior to 1750 because of the inclusions that was into it and the way the metal was made up. So Borehole 10X became one of the more famous shafts outside of the money pit. And then in 1971, they lowered a television camera down to the, the bottom of Borehole 10X and nobody was prepared for what flashed up onto the screen. Uh, what appeared to be a human hand severed at the wrist was seen and gently floating in the water-filled void. And um, that was very startling. And believe it or not, they did not record that particular um, camera expedition down borehole 10X. But they did have five other tries at it, and one of them they made over two and a half hours of videotape. Uh, actually, this Sony one-inch reel-to-reel um, film and was converted to uh, videotape many years later, and the Oak Island Tourism Society is lucky enough and fortunate enough to have a copy of it. It's only about a half hour long, but boy, I'll tell you, there's some startling images to be seen in that um, in that videotape. So as you can imagine, they tried to lower divers down into the hole, and they did, and uh, just picture being lowered down 235 feet down on the ground in a hole that was eventually um, enlarged to 27 inches in diameter, lined with quarter-inch steel all the way down to bedrock, which is at about 180 feet. And then from there, they just uh, descend it down through the, the cut, the rough cut in the, the bedrock till they get into this chamber. And some of the divers I've spoken to about it said that they were standing in a chamber believed to be about six, seven, eight feet high, and they could actually hear rock tumbling down from the excavation from when the drill had gone through a year or so previous. You can imagine how unstable and dangerous that was. But anyway, these guys get down their hands and knees groping around trying to find some of this metal that they saw, human remains and um, an object that looks like a, a treasure chest, uh, other things that look like tools and that sort of thing, and they didn't bring up anything of interest. And uh, it still remains a mystery to this day. Later on, I, I can't remember what year it was, it was in the 1970s, Borehole 10X collapsed. The Blankenship was working at about 140 feet down this hole, uh, cutting um, observation holes into the, the side of the casing, trying to find out where that metal came from. And you could see the mud and the muck sliding down around the pipe, and he realized that they were experiencing some sort of a cave-in, and uh, 
he hollered to his son to start winching him out of the hole, where they had little radio communication system at the time. It took, took his son David 34 seconds to winch his uh, father out of the hole. And when he got past the 90 foot level, Dan said that he could look down below his feet and he saw the pipe crushing below his feet. And it absolutely collapsed Borehole 10X. But I'll tell you something. These guys, um, these guys are something else. They decided then to open up that hole from a 27 inch round hole to an 8 foot in diameter hole. They started lining it with uh, railway tanker cars with the ends cut out of them. And on end, they welded them together and started you know, jamming this thing down in the hole. And it ended at 181 feet. And uh, the reason it ended, they had a bitter breakup between the partnership between um, Dan Blankship and his partner David Tobias. The partnership dissolved and uh, work stopped in Borehole 10X. And we're all anxiously awaiting the uh, possibility of someday them opening up this hole again. Those guys are crazy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you right now, Tim, they wouldn't get me down that 27 inch in diameter hole with a gun pressed to my temple. It happen. <laughs> yeah. I'll take the bullet first. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And I, as I pointed out uh, in the article, that I wrote for After Dark, uh, that when you go to Oak Island, you can still pretty much look down into 10X, and it's just a scary, scary view, pretty much. I can't imagine oh, yeah. going down Oh, yeah. When there. you look down, it, you're only looking down as far as about 30 feet, and then the water starts. If that thing was drained out, it would make it pass through from Disney just to see how deep that, uh, that hole is, straight down 181 feet to the bedrock, and there's where it sits, right on top of bedrock right now and they only have another 54 feet to go. And uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about that I haven't really uh, even talked about with you yet was something that you pointed out along the tour of Oak Island, and that was the, the rock that sort of was part of a larger uh, cross that was formed on the mm -hmm. island. Um, talk a little bit about that story and the theory that's that's going around with that. Well, it's commonly referred to as Nolan's Cross, and it's, it's a cross made up of stones. I think it's something like six stones. I can't remember the exact number of stones that, that comprise this cross. But it's over 900 feet long from the base to the top, and the arms are about 600 feet long, give or take. And um, these stones form the shape of a Christian cross or a Celtic cross, whatever you want to call it. It was discovered by Fred Nolan. Uh, Fred Nolan uh, came to Oak Island in the late 50s, around the time that uh, uh, Robert... Um, uh, Restall came to Oak Island. He wanted to get involved with Treasure Hunt, but he was always sort of uh, put off by the ownership, and they never gave him an opportunity. And, of course, as I told you earlier, Fred Nolan's the one who surveyed those uh, lots, because he is a surveyor by trade, and discovered that they weren't properly transferred and ended up owning, owning a major um, acreage on Oak Island. So, because he's such a, a keen surveyor and keen on the mystery of Oak Island, he did a lot of surveying on his property, and at various times, actually, he surveyed other parts of Oak Island. And because of the surveying, he found those cross. And what he discovered was that all the stones in this cross were sort of conical in shape. They had sort of a point onto them, and they all lined up rather well with the surveyor's transit. It's very difficult to believe that this is a natural formation when you consider that these stones aren't little rocks that you know, you and I could push in place just to fool some treasure hunters. These rocks weigh 10 tons each. So to have, you know, six stones of 10 tons each line up in the sh form the shape of a, of a cross on Oak Island, it's a little hard to believe that that's uh, just a natural placement. But anyway, of course, some people believe it is natural, and other people believe it's highly significant. Myself, I'm, I'm waiting, uh, I'm waiting to see how this all pans out. But, uh, nonetheless, uh, there's a lot of people who believe that the, the, the Oak Island Cross or Nolan Cross is uh, very, very uh, significant to the story of uh, who made the deposit under Oak Island or even if indeed there is a deposit underneath of Oak Island. And it's one of um, many stone-type structures that have been found in Oak Island over the years that uh, people believe have been left over by the originators, whoever they were. Another sort of uh, interesting story that, that isn't part of the Money Pit lore, I guess you could say, is uh, some of these ghost stories. You said originally that even back in the day that Oak Island had a, a reputation for being haunted. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess talk about some of the other paranormal elements to, to Oak Island that, that sort of get, get lost in the shuffle behind the, the Money Pit story. <laughs> well, there's a lot of them. Uh, one being, uh, there's supposedly uh, people have seen a dog with fiery red eyes appear whenever you're digging in the ground, and uh, that'd be scary enough. And there's supposed to be um, a crow that would come and visit people who are digging, and that would just sort of stick around and gave people the creeps. 
I, I never, I, all the time I've spent on Oak Island, I've never seen anything odd myself. But I, I did have a peculiar experience one time with uh, one of our guests on Oak Island when I was a tour guide out there. He had, um, he had been walking up what we call the Beach Road, which is a, a short um, sort of a, a, a cutoff road that goes between the center of the island down to the ocean and then follows along the beach and makes access to the uh, money pit area. And when you leave the beach area and walk up the, the beach road, it's it's kind of a dark road. It's overgrown with a lot of trees. It's kind of spooky. It's next to a swamp. And so myself and another guide were waiting for all the people to get off the island late one afternoon so we could go home. And we knew that there was one guy left on the island. He didn't show, and he didn't show. Finally, this guy started to, to appear down the road, and he's walking very fast up the road. His eyes are as big as saucers, and he's all a bath of sweat. We said, geez, you know, you okay? And he said that he'd experienced quite an unusual phenomenon down in the beach road. And what he felt was he, he was walking along, and all of a sudden he walked out of the warm air in the cold air. Well, that's not particularly unusual on an island in Nova Scotia because you have cooler air near, next to the ocean, and warmer air in um, in the uh, you know in amongst the forest, whatever have you. But this guy claimed that he could stand, and there's a definitive line that he could put right down over his body that he could stand in and out of the cold zone into the warm zone, and he could have it so that one side of his body and one side of his body, one side of his body was warm, the other side of his body was cold. And I'll tell you, Tim, I, I was a police officer one time, and I saw fear in people's eyes, and um, I know what fear in people's eyes looked like, and this guy had that fear. He had no desire to go back down to show us where the spot was. In fact, he trundled off the island, and they tell me back the, at the parking lot, when he got to his car, he jumped in his car, and he boogied off the island as fast as he could get out of there. Huh. And I probably would have forgotten about that story. I, I did write it up into um, a little story on uh, the Oak Island Tourism Society's website. But, geez, this year, when we were bringing back uh, a tour of people, I think it was on Sunday Sunday afternoon, I was walking along with a lady who experienced the exact same thing. And I was with her. I was walking along with her. And I thought, was, oh, what a bunch of nonsense. So I said, can I feel your arm? And I felt her arm, and Tim, I'm telling you, her arm was as cold as cold as a cadaver. Her oh, wow. arm was cold. She has goosebumps on her arm. She said she had difficulty in breathing. And of course, I started being very concerned the woman may be having a heart attack or something, although she was fairly young, probably in her 30s, early 40s, I suppose. But, uh, boy, she just freaked out. And I, like I say, I was walking right along with her, and I didn't experience it. But nonetheless, she did. It was the exact same experience that was um told me by this guy way the heck back in uh, the late um, or the uh, the mid 70s when I uh, heard that story so there's some there's some unusual stories for you about Oak Island wow. and a lot of people who step on the Oak Island either feel a, a sense of foreboding or they feel a great sense of calm that overcomes them when they get on the island and I've talked to a lot of very lucid people who have um, explained that very uh, phenomenon to me. They said that, that when they walk in Oak Island, they feel very calm, very peaceful, very rested, and relaxed. And I must say, every time that I get on the island, I feel exactly the same way. But there has been some people that have expressed to me that uh, they feel uh, a little uptight, they feel um, a little scared. I don't know why, but nonetheless, there it is. Weird, yeah. Well, I definitely felt the sense of calm when I got on the island for sure. Yeah. It was, uh, it's very, it's very uh, serene. Yeah. Oh, it is. It's a beautiful island. Oh, it's 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 amazing. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about the Oak Island Tourism Society and how that came about, and um, and sort of what made you guys decide to to form this organization. Well, our initial goal for the Oak Island Tourism Society, we want to have a world-class interpretive center established on Oak Island, and we want to offer up walking tours um, every day of the year to people who want to come and experience the mystery of Oak Island. We feel that would be a, a very, very uh, popular tourism draw, and uh, we want to do it in a way that's uh, professional and ethical and moral and uh, remembers the treasure hunters of the past, people who have died searching for the treasure, all that sort of thing. We don't want to turn it into a um, an amusement park type of an affair. We want it to be very tasteful and that sort of business. So, well, five years ago, our local government uh, representative, who's called the 
the MLA, and uh, the MLA approached me and said, Dan, uh, what do you think about the idea? And I said, geez, John, I think that's a fabulous idea. So John Chadway, a member of the Legislative Assembly, MLA, and myself, and a group of um, other guys, about uh, six of us, we got together and formed the Oak Island Tourism Society, and we turned it into a non-profit charitable organization, and then we opened it up to uh, membership from around the world. And, uh, I can brag that we have members all through the United States, all across Canada, all across Nova Scotia. We even have a member in New Zealand, for gosh sakes. How much further away can you get than New Zealand? And um, so we, we formed our society and accepted membership from around the world, and we've been lobbying the government of Nova Scotia to try and uh, help us form a tourism project in Oak Island. The, um, the owners of Oak Island have uh, not not throwing any water on uh, the fire of our desire to, to do this project. In fact, they've been very encouraging. And uh, probably the worst opposition we've run into so far is actually with the government to, um, you know, obviously never have the money to do any of these projects. They're always talking poor about But uh, we continue to try and convince them that the Oak Island should be opened up uh, 365 days of the year so people don't have to come in the, in the our festival that we have every year just to explore Oak Island. So that, in essence, is what we're trying to do. And um, right now we have our website that people can visit, uh, www.oakislandsociety.ca, and they can read our mission statement and um, read some of the news uh, news that we've created over the past five years with uh, trying to get people to understand that this would be a great spot to bring tourists and, and to show them around uh, our little piece of heaven here. Yeah, definitely. Now, you had done tours at Oak Island in the 70s, and then they stopped in, uh, I believe, like the mid-90s, right? What, right? what was the scenario with that? Just that it wasn't viable anymore for the owners to run that sort of thing, or was it just like in the midst of the change in ownership, they had to shut, shut down the tours? Well, when the tours started back in 1973, it was uh, it was uh, started with a lot of hoopla, a lot of media attention and whatever have you. For about four years, tours were run by the province of Nova Scotia, the department excuse me, the Department of Tourism. And uh, during that time, there was still a lot of fighting going on between Triton Alliance Limited and Fred Nolan over ownership of the land. And a seesaw back and forth and caused us, uh, us being the, the tourism department at the time, a lot of trouble. We had to alternately take people by bus and we let them drive on the island and at one point in time because of the uh, land being blocked up. We actually had to take people over by boat and land them on the island of the wharf. And by 1976, the government had enough. They threw their hands up and said, "Afraid us, we can't, we can't be involved with this anymore. It's just too, too much trouble trying to organize all different types of tours to get out to the island." And they sort of gave it up. So the treasure hunters, uh, led by Dan Blankenship, they took over the tours and ran them until about 1995. And as Dan put it to me, he said, "Look, we're treasure hunters, not tour guides, and uh, we didn't want to be involved with it anymore." So the interest is there, but. Uh, they just didn't want to. They didn't want to do it, and uh, they gave it up. So uh, we've been, we being the Oak Island Tourism Society, has been trying to do it ever since. So once a year, we have a little festival we call Explore Oak Island Days, and uh, during our festival, we take people out on guided tours and we show them all sorts of artifacts. So we put together a little uh, two-day museum sort of thing, and um, you know, titillate people, show them, show them all the interesting things about Oak Island, and of course, get them on the island. That's that's the important thing. So you actually walk the grounds and see where all this stuff is. Definitely. As I said, I was there this year, and it is awesome, and I highly recommend it to uh, anyone who wants to check it out. It's a, it's a once a year, potentially once in a lifetime type of opportunity, so you can't really pass it up. Exactly. You know, everybody wants to know what's kind of going on now, I guess, with the island and that kind of thing. And, of course, uh, we know uh, the new ownership and some people have uh, purchased the island in the last five or so years. I don't know the exact date. I'm sure you know. Um, yeah. Talk about the new ownership and what's going on right now at Oak Island. What's the latest uh, at the island? Well, it's very exciting, actually. Uh, Oak Island treasure hunting has remained sort of dormant ever since about 1995, although there has been at least two individuals out on, uh, out on Oak Island uh, with their theories and uh, tested them out, and which, of course, were not overly successful. Although, I must say, the last guy who was here in 2003, Petter Amundsen from Norway, uh, made some interesting discoveries, but nonetheless, no treasure. So, 
Because of the breakup of the partnership between Tobias and Blankship in 1995, they've been seesawing back and forth with lawsuits and all that sort of thing. So finally they decided um, through a court order that Oak Island would be liquidated because it was the only asset that the company really owned. So the liquidation thing was coming up, and the, the, it could have been sold. Oak Island could have been sold to anybody. And actually, uh, the Oak Island Tourism Society had the provincial government convinced to uh, actually uh, look at purchasing Oak Island at one point in time. But government legs moved very, very slowly. And while while they were shuffling and dancing from foot to foot, Dan Blankenship was out looking for partners. By God, he found four partners, four very interested partners in Traverse City, Michigan. So these four guys have partnered with Dan, and between them, the five of them, they own 78% of Oak Island. And they own, um, you know, most of the good stuff, and by that I mean uh, Four Hole 10X, the Money Pit area, Flood Tunnels areas, all that sort of thing. And uh, these guys have applied for a thing called a Treasure Trove License. Now, in Canada... There's only one province that requires that you purchase a treasure trove license if you're looking for treasure, and it's here, right here in Nova Scotia. We're the only province out of the uh, ten provinces and two ter- three territories that has uh, a treasure trove license, and uh, you have to apply to the government. And uh, so these guys, this new group, decided, yes, we are going to apply to the government for a new treasure trove license, and they did, and the government said, not so fast. You guys can't have a treasure trove license until the ones that were issued a number of years ago expire, and they don't expire until 2008, and that's when you guys can get your your TTL. Huh. So uh, this uh, this was really a slap across the face for these guys, as they really thought that um, where they had purchased all the assets of uh, the previous group, that there shouldn't be a problem. But the government said, well, here's the problem: if if you guys were to discover a treasure, and um, you know, you claim it's yours. Well, of course, the, the prior owners of uh, the Treasure Trove license, Triton Alliance Limited, which is over 100 investors, uh, they're going to want to have their little little piece of it too. And we're not going to set ourselves up and the people of Nova Scotia into a lawsuit. So therefore, you know, you guys have to wait. So these fellows being very astute businessmen and not being too dumb, I can tell you right now, these guys are extremely smart and astute businessmen. They said, okay. Let's go out there, contact every one of the Triton investors. We'll either pay them what, what they paid to invest in the treasure hunt, or we'll make it, uh, make them partners in their new venture. That's exactly what they did. So right now, treasure hunting may start as early as this fall. Of course, we just started to fall this week, so sometime in the next couple of weeks we may see treasure hunting begin. And if it doesn't, it will definitely begin in June of 2008 when uh, the uh, treasure hunting, uh, the treasure trove license is expired. And uh, I'm willing to bet you money that uh, these guys will be at it before before December. They'll be out there drilling. Oh wow! Yeah. And now the big buzz, I guess you could say, at the weekend this past August was this ground freezing technique that uh, yeah. was presented. Does that seem to be the general idea of uh, the best way to go about it now, or are there theories about? what the best way to go about it is that are still being bandied about and, and do these new owners have uh have they given any indication about exactly how they plan on hunting the treasure? Well I'll tell you Tim, the treasure hunters don't tell Danny Henniger everything. <laughs> I, I'm not an investor, so therefore I'm a sort of a guy on the outside who's very interested, and I know all these fellows. But you know, they they keep their cards pretty close to their to their vest, and they're mm-hmm. not going to show off their cards. During Explore Oak Island days, one of the uh, the new owners took the floor to speak to people for a little bit. We had uh, quite a few people gathered uh, downstairs, and where our guest speakers spoke, and. Um, he was asked that very question, and uh, his his response was, "Look, you know, it's 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 a great idea, and we're not going to discount anything." And uh, I know they've certainly talked to the engineers. I know they had a private meeting with them uh, to discuss this freeze ring technique. And uh, initially, when the freeze ring technique idea came out, it was um, it would have cost about fifteen million dollars. But it wasn't just freezing the ground around the money pit; they were also going to build dams around the the odor. Uh, the other part of Oak Island to stop the flow of the water too, and that would have been horrendously expensive. Well, obviously, fifteen million dollars, and uh, I don't know if these guys want to spend that kind of money or not. So, what they are going to do, according to a recent newspaper article I read, is uh, they're going to do some some exploration on their own, and if they they find the evidence that um, 
that has been told to them to exist, uh, they're going to spend some major money. Now, whether they uh, develop the freeze ring technique or not, I don't know. But for your listeners, what the freeze ring technique is, picture drilling a series of very deep holes, maybe 250 feet deep, all around the money pit area in a circle of like 80 feet in diameter. Once you freeze the ground, then this is a simple matter. You no longer have to worry about any water problems because everything's blocked off with ice, and you keep the juice running in these holes. Uh, it's sort of like a hockey rink. If you can picture a hockey rink stood up on end and then uh, put in the ground, but only placed around those circles instead of a flat surface, mm-hmm. that's the idea. And apparently it's, a, it's an engineering concept that's been used around the world in places where the ground is too wet to work in, so they, they just freeze it and chisel it out. And uh, that's what they like to do, uh, the, the engineers anyway, that have uh, proposed this idea. And uh, we'll have to wait and see if the, the so-called Michigan group, the new group, decides that uh, they're going to they're gonna try this or not. Now talk a little bit about your book here that you co-wrote, The Oak yeah. Island Code. The Oak Island Code. Well, we're the only book in existence that actually answers the mystery of Oak Island and uh your readers are just going to have to buy one from us, and uh, for God's sakes, don't read the last page first because you'll ruin all the rest of the book. <laughs> but what it is, it's it's a work of fiction, a work of parody, and uh, myself and Darcy O'Connor, my co-author, we uh, we wrote the book with um, tongue in cheek, and uh, it's the first book of its kind ever written about Old Island, a bit of a comedy, and it basically circles around a group of people who. Um, this is a, a website out of uh, London, England called uh, oakislandtreasure.co.uk. And it's run by a good friend of ours, Joe Atherton, who is um, you know, a young lady who uh, developed this uh, Oak Island website. It's actually become one of the premier websites in the world about Oak Island. I highly encourage everybody to visit that website and have a look. But there's a lot of interesting characters who post on that site, and we used all these characters in this wild rump that goes all across Nova Scotia and around Oak Island, over to England and back again, and we actually uh, solved the mystery of Oak Island. It's only 12 bucks, and you can buy it from the Oak Island Tourism Society, and I highly recommend that book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and by the way, the profits from the book don't come back to Darcy and I. The, the profits are 100% um, exclusive to the Oak Island Tourism Society, so don't think you're putting uh, $12 in Danny Henniker's pocket because I get nothing out of it. In fact, it costs me money. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but it's an interesting story, and it's a, it's a great fundraiser for the society, and people have read the book and have had a good laugh over it, and uh, boy, oh boy, you read that last page, there's your answer. Awesome, awesome. Um, one thing I wanted to ask that came up here during the interview, uh, the monument that's on Oak Island, is that a product of the Oak Island Tourism Society, or was that put up by owners or the government, or where'd that come from? That uh, There's actually two monuments on Oak Island, and uh, there's one out by the Causeway, a large granite monument, and that's to the uh, memory of all six treasure hunters who have died over the years, and there's another one made of cement with a bronze plaque on to it, very, very close to where Robert Restall died on the eastern end of Oak Island. Now, um, I think Dan Blankship paid for the one that was out uh, on the eastern end of Oak Island, made of cement with a bronze plaque, and the one um, the one on the, the causeway end of the island, I think, was paid for uh, with some government money, some uh, community money, and that sort of thing, and that was placed there in 1995 when uh, the Blankenships uh, hosted and put together, along with people in the community, and put together the bicentennial anniversary of Oak Island. It was quite a quite a nice uh, party. A lot of activities going on all week long. It was uh, quite nice. And that monument, was, I thought, was a really nice touch um, to honor the memory of the people who have died on the island. Because, you know, it's because of their work and their sacrifices that we all have the story to deal with we have today. When the new owners get going on the digging and everything, they're still going to allow the tours and stuff, right? Uh, the annual tours? Oh, that's a roll of the dice. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I sure hope that these guys... Uh, Give us the opportunity to bring people out there. Uh, when I was a tour guide back in 73 to 75, uh, tour, um, treasure hunting was ongoing. They were working hard, and uh, what we did, we just led people around it and uh, never took them over close to where the, the digging was going on. It was dangerous. There was a lot of machinery and uh, a 
open holes and that sort of thing. I see no reason this, in this world why we couldn't do that. Again, uh, take people on a tour and don't get them too close to the open pits and whatever have you. So we'll have to see. I sure hope they'll they'll uh, give us permission to do it again. But, uh, you know, it's, it's their treasure hunt. It's their land, and we'll just have to deal with uh, whatever decision they make. Exactly, exactly. Well, it was a great tour. I really enjoyed it a lot, and uh, I highly recommend it anyone did. check it out. What's next for you? What do you have coming up on the horizon? Anything you want to plug or – or anything like that, and uh, you, maybe you know the dates for next year's Oak Island days, or if not, uh, we'll know it's in August, right? Well, uh, everything is everything is up in the air for next year, and the reason being uh, because we've generated a lot of attention and uh, we've generated a lot of interest from the businesses in the area, from the citizens and whatever have you. We've been approached by various entities to uh, consider changing our dates and partnering with them, and we have some really interesting opportunities uh, in front of us that we're going to explore, and uh, our executive has already uh, been speaking speaking to various entities about it, and uh, we have some nice surprises coming up, I think, for 2008. And any of the listeners out there who may be considering the trip to um, Nova Scotia next year, I would highly advise that if you want to see Oak Island and want to be uh, part parcel of this Explore Oak Island Days, the three-day festival we always have, is to keep an eye on our website. And I'm willing to bet you that before the end of this year, we'll have some exciting announcements to make, and uh, it'll be it'll be a lot of fun. Awesome. And you'll get your you'll get your boots wet with Oak Island, I'll guarantee you, one way or the other. Oh, for sure, for sure. It was an all-encompassing weekend, and I, I had a blast. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a great meeting you and meeting uh, people who came along, and uh, it's it, it always is. Uh, to me, that's what makes Explore Oak Island is the interesting characters that show up and the people with great stories to tell and wonderful interest in the mystery, and uh, there's nothing I love any better than showing people Oak Island. Of course, the website is oakislandsociety.ca. Danny, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I had a blast talking to you, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you again up there in Nova Scotia at Oak Island. Well, I'll tell you, Tim, it's my absolute pleasure. And uh, like, I, like the uh, Oak Island uh, um, posters used to say, when I was a tour guide in Oak Island, perhaps the day you visit the island, the treasure will be found. All right. Thanks for coming on the show. You're quite welcome. That does it for this week's edition of BOA Audio Season 3. Big, big thanks to Danny Hennigar for coming on the show. Of course, you can find out more information on Danny Hennigar at the following website, www.oakislandsociety.ca. Check it out. In lieu of our normal BOA Audio listener feedback, we're going to pass over that this week. Let the emails accumulate. You can, of course, get in touch with me at boaaudio at hotmail.com or at the contact section of binallofamerica.com. We'll be bringing back the feedback next week on the program. But, as I said, in lieu of that, I want to give a shout-out and big thanks to a couple of websites that have been instrumental in getting the word out on BOA Audio. For starters, I want to thank Anomalist.com. The Anomalist is not just a fantastic news-based website. It also is an excellent publishing house, which has provided a number of great books to BOA Audio, which allow us to segue into getting those guests on the program. Folks like Tony Healy of the book The Yowie and Brad Steiger, of course, our season finale guest, came to us via our contacts at The Anomalist. So huge thanks to the folks at The Anomalist for your help and support in getting the word out on BOA Audio. Additionally, I want to give a huge shout-out to The Daily Grail, or as those of us in the know call it, TDG. You can find The Daily Grail at dailygrail.com. The Daily Grail is also an excellent news and opinion site that has been a great help in turning people on to BOA Audio. They have been linking to us for just so long now that I just can't thank them enough. And I'm very excited to point out that The Daily Grail has just released their first-ever book, under the title of Dark Lore, Volume 1. And Dark Lore is a 304-page missive that features contributions from leading esoteric experts like Lauren Coleman, Nick Redfern, Daniel Pinchbeck, Michael Grosso, Blair Blake, Michael Prescott, and our old friend Adam Go Rightly. And these contributions cover a number of different subjects, from the Sphinx, the Flying Triangle sightings, existence for the afterlife, and all kinds of other great stuff. That can all be found in the new Daily Grail book, Dark Lore, Volume 1. Available on Amazon US and Amazon UK. And you can find out more information on the book at 
darklord.dailygrail.com. Check it out. It is a fantastic book. The great folks at TDG have already sent me a copy of Dark Lore, and I've been reading it over the past week or so, and it is a really cool book with a lot of great insight into a myriad of subjects. So definitely check out Dark Lore. So there you go. Huge thanks and shout out to Anomalous.com and DailyGrail.com, two of the big, massive websites that have been big time BOA audio supporters and backers over the last couple of years. And I really can't thank them enough for their help and support. Speaking of help and support, of course, we have to thank the great FinallofAmerica.com staff, Leslie, Chiron, R. Lee, Joe V., and Tina Senna. Week in and week out, they are providing top-notch content for BinAllOfAmerica.com and providing behind-the-scenes insight, feedback, and support on all the different stuff that I'm putting out there on the website. Chances are, before you see it or hear it, it's been heard by the BOA staff. They helped shape the whole BOA franchise. So, huge thanks to the great staff of BinAllOfAmerica.com for your help and support with the audio series and the website. Now comes the time in the program where I ask you to donate some money to help keep Been All of America up and running. Chances are, if you're hearing this, you're a hardcore BOA audio listener. You stick around to the very end of the program. I appreciate that. We need donations to keep the show up and running. Some of these phone calls are over an hour long, and I'm calling all over the country and all over the world, and the bills for that sort of thing pile up, not to mention the bandwidth and all the other associated costs that come with putting together a program like this. How can you help support BOA Audio? That's simple. You go to BinAllOfAmerica.com, you click the PayPal button, and you make a donation. No donation is too small, and all donations go towards helping keep BOA Audio up and running, commercial-free, and free for our listeners the world over. For those folks who are uncomfortable just giving money away for something that they're already getting for free, I'm happy to inform you that we are in the midst of redesigning the BOA merchandise. We are going to be rolling out a whole new line of merchandise that I guarantee you're going to want to get your hands on. It's going beyond just BOA merchandise into a whole different realm, if you will. It's going to be our own line. And when you see it, you're going to say, God damn it, I want that shirt. So hopefully you'll do that. You'll pick up the shirt, and in turn, that will help keep BOA up and running. Stay tuned to BOA for the upcoming release of the merchandise line. I'm serious, folks. We're putting a lot of work into this. You're going to flip your wig when you see this stuff, and I know you're going to want it because I've put a lot of thought into what people really want and need as far as apparel goes in the esoteric world. Before we close out the program, we have a whole other portion of the end cap here that we have to talk about. Of course, that is the preview for next week's program. Our guest will be Greg Reese, author of UFO Religion. I'm stunned personally that we have not heard much from Greg Reese on the many other esoteric radio programs. You're going to hear a lot from him next week on BOA Audio. In this tremendously deep episode, we're going to go beyond the lights in the sky and discuss the belief systems associated with the UFO phenomenon, ranging from the dichotomy of nuts and bolts ufology versus the lunatic fringe, the contactee movement, UFO cults, mainstream religions with the UFO elements within them, and how UFO revelations may affect Christianity. We'll be talking about the paradox of the ancient astronaut theory, along with the paradox of ufology versus science. Plus, we're going to find out about Greg's problems with abduction research, how UFOs get blamed for everything paranormal, new gods versus old gods, fear as the driving force behind ufology, and, of course, tons and tons more. This interview covers a myriad of big-picture questions with regards to ufology and belief, that will leave you thinking about the UFO phenomenon in a whole different light and provide you with a wealth of food for thought. This one is a killer episode. That's next week. Greg Reese talking about UFO religion on Been All of America Audio Season 3. And on that note, I've got nothing left to say, my friends. Until you hear from me next week, this is Tim Benall, thanking you for listening and signing off. <laughs>